notion of peace studies? Um, maybe if you could introduce yourself who you are, and then uh, okay. Back to my okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. My name is Doug Rawlings. Uh, I retired six years ago from the University of Maine at Farmington, where I did a number of different things for 27 years. But the last three years, four years of it, I, I taught a course in peace studies, and I'm now. Uh, I've gone back into the university and I'm teaching two courses this fall semester and we'll probably be teaching it for, for quite a while. It's part of a series of courses we call first year seminars, which are introductory courses for first year students. So the course itself is an acclimation course, if you will. Um, but uh, the beauty of it, the design, there's about 18 of them being offered in, in the opening uh, semester. The beauty of the design is that we get to teach to our passions. Um, we have to provide, obviously, a detailed and justified curriculum, uh, but we teach that passion. My passion comes from my own experience as being a, a veteran of the Vietnam War, um, founding member of Veterans for Peace, um, active member in Veterans for Peace for, since its uh, uh, start back in 1985. Five of us, by the way, here in Maine started Veterans for Peace in 1985. And now we're up to about 5,000 members, 130 chapters nationally, six international chapters, NGO status at the United Nations. Our uh, convention this year is in St. Paul, Minnesota. Last year was in Chicago. Previous year was in, in San Francisco, San Diego, Dallas, Boston, et cetera, et cetera. Our first convention was in the basement of Woodford's church. Uh, <laughs> there were 12 of us. Uh, now we, we're anticipating about 500 people at a convention in St. Paul. Um, so it's really grown. So, so one of the messages I like to, to, to give to young people in a peace studies course is that you can start small, the old Margaret Mead statement, and that's how you, that's how you really start things. The five of us had no idea that this organization would uh, take off like it's taken off, right? It's provided a real um, sounding board for veterans and, and, a, and a place for us to get together and really talk about our concerns and also work for, for peace. So I offer a course in peace studies, and I, I tell the students that um, there are universities that have peace studies departments and, and majors, uh, and there are a number of different peace studies courses. So it can take all kinds of different shapes and forms. I decided that what I want to focus in on is uh, nonviolent direct action, what I call it, and I focus on, on wars. I, I, I actually. Um, that's unfair to say that about myself. Let me backtrack and say that I, I have, midway through the course, we begin to look at, looking at, at various wars, uh, World War I, World War II, the uh, Vietnam War, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars, in terms of um, resistance to those wars, but doing it nonviolently. Um, the book that I use is a wonderful book by Staunton Lind, Staunton and Alice Lind, called A History of Nonviolence in America, uh, starting with um, the Quakers in the 17th century, running right through this particular uh, edition, runs through the Persian Gulf War. Uh, the next edition, which is coming out next year, will go right up to the present times, and will include uh, material from the book that I'm also responsible for editing called Letters to the Wall, um, which I also use in the course. So, one of, I, I, I love baiting students. They're 18 year old students, right? And, they're, and it's a first semester on, in a college experience. So I, my first day of class, I give them the syllabus, detailed syllabus. And I say to them, so, so, so how far did you guys get in history, right? Inevitably, they refer to history in terms of war. We got through the Korean War. We got through the Vietnam War. We got through World War II. I said, you know, isn't there another way that we could perhaps look at American history besides through the lens of war? How about all these nonviolent movements that are taking place? And there are a lot of them. Uh, and I, have, and I, not, I don't just use this book, I use a lot of handouts. Um, I love Sun Magazine, for example. Uh, they have great interviews and great material. I use all kinds of stuff. So, so I give them this, this detailed syllabus. Uh, and I don't kid myself, for a peace studies course, you have to be realistic. Um, it's limited to 16 students, although I've taken up to 20 students, depending upon the interest. And I realize about a third of them are taking the course because it fit their schedule. They have no interest in peace studies at all, right? The other third are really interested in peace studies, and the other third want to fight me on it, uh, which is great. 
uh, and, and not fight, you know, it's just, they want to push back. And, and basically, you know, they're under the impression that war is inherent. We're, we're hardwired to go to war as human beings, and it's inevitable, uh, and all we can do is, is live with it, right? And I give a material that counters that whole, that whole notion, uh, one of which is, for example, it's called the Seville Statement. I, I, it was written in the 1980s. It's a United Nations uh, committee put it together of psychologists, psychiatrists, anthropologists, whatever. And they came to the conclusion, and they say it scientifically, that we are not hardwired as human beings to go to war. War is a cultural decision. It's not something that we have to do biologically. It's not, we're not, it's not driven by evolution forces. It's not driven by genetics. It's a cultural choice, all right? So I start with that. I also have the students look at a, a, a just war theory, St. Augustine's, sixth century, I think it is, fifth century, came up with it. And ironically, he came up with it, I think, to justify the Christian wars, right? I mean, the question is, how can you kill another human being when it says in the Bible, thou shalt not kill, right? Uh, and so he developed this just war theory, and I use the version that Stanford University has put out in their philosoph uh, philosophical encyclopedia. And they say, basically, you look at it in three, in three phases. You look at before the war, during the war, and after the war. Uh, and there are certain criteria that have to be met for, this, for a war to be just. Uh, and all 18, there's six in each category, all 18 of those have to be met for a war to be just. And, and I give it to the students as an, you know, I, try not to, I try not to get on my, on, on my hobby horse too much, right? Uh, I say, okay, you can use this theory to justify war or not to. Right? Let's take a look at it. Um, and we come to the conclusion um, that there's no war that's ever been justified, ever, using these principles. Uh, you know, uh, principle, you, know, you have to have a just cause to, be, to begin with, right? Uh, during the war itself, you, have, you cannot kill uh, non-combatants, you can't torture non-combatants, you cannot use uh, weapons such as today, chemical weapons, all that. You can't do any of that. Once you do that, the war is unjustified, right? And after the war is over with, you're supposed to take care of reparations. Uh, you're supposed to take care of the people who were hurt during the war. You're supposed to work for a peaceful re resolution so that there won't be any more wars. So I sort of rhetorically asked the students, give me a war that's met all of these principles. Can't, we can't do it, right? Um, but still, still, I have students who are writing in my course trying to def defend wars. And, 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 I, and I get a, a fair amount of them. I teach in a rural campus. Um, and, a, and a fair amount of them, their loved ones are in the military. Um, what, I, what I don't do, come on, come on in. At least I try not to do this. Um, I don't tell them uh, that I'm a veteran. Um, uh, until probably the course is at least a third of the way through. Uh, sort of reinforcing their, their, I think they're thinking that here's this old duffer and he's wearing tie-dye t-shirts. I don't, but you know, <laughs> and headbands, and, you know, it's like, oh man, all he did was smoke dope and do, you know. You know. So eventually though, it comes across that I, I am in fact a veteran, you know, and, I'm, and in fact, I, I, I was in, in Vietnam, right? Uh, and then I get these comments from the kids who are now, given my age, their grandfather was in Vietnam, right? You know, and, 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 and talks glowingly about what he did and all that stuff, for a, a lot of this stuff, or how badly he was treated when he got back and all that stuff. And I try to, you know, gently move the conversation around so those kind of things are not dominating what's going on. So the, the course itself, the Peace Studies course itself, then gets into, well, if these wars are wrong, um, how can we resist them? Uh, and how can we do it? How can how can we do it nonviolently? Uh, hence, I give them stuff like Gene Sharp's 198 Methods of Nonviolence, uh, which is really quite fascinating. Uh, we read a fair amount of Gandhi stuff. We look at uh, Martin Luther King Jr. stuff. Um, I have a, a film series. I'm thinking the name of it now. A Force More Powerful, which is a wonderful documentary film on six. Uh, major uh, 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 nonviolent resistance movements, starting with the uh, African American students in the 19, it's early 1960s, Nashville, who sat in counters, and it shows it's all documentary footage, and it shows these kids, college kids, uh, organizing, going through all kinds of training to deal with b being called uh, you know, niggers, getting you know cigarettes put out in their hair, trash, and stuff like that, and then they actually they actually go and they sit down in these lunch counters. The students are just absolutely riveted. And, 
And they sit there, and then these white thugs come in with the police standing right there, and they're given 15 minutes. They're told this, by the way, ahead of time. They said, okay, when we get to this place, we've heard that they're going to let this gang in, and they're going to beat you guys up for 15 minutes before the police come. They know that. They go in there, they sit down. Sure enough, these guys come in, and it's right there on the film. These guys grabbing these kids, punching them, stuff like that. The cops arrest the black kids, of course. And, like, and then immediately, another wave of students come in and sit right back down again, just sit there. The kids are going, what? What? And shows that. And it shows eventually them organizing. It became a national movement. It shows these kids. And eventually getting the mayor to admit uh, on the steps of the, of the Capitol building that the the uh, 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 facilities in Nashville have been segregated and they're no longer to be segregated. They broke the segregation thing, right? And the students see this, right? And these young kids, these are, it took about uh, nine months, a year for all of this to start developing. So we, have, we watch that kind of stuff. We watch Gandhi's famous salt march, uh, where again, totally through nonviolence, he changes things against a really repressive regime. So what I'm trying to get to the students, and I picked the word, I used nonviolent direct action um, purposefully because I don't say pacifism because oftentimes they hear passive when they hear pacifism, right? And I'm saying, no, this takes incredible courage, nonviolent direct action. And as Gandhi said, specifically, he said, blood will flow, but it will be ours. It won't be theirs. And again, they have pictures of these guys beating up these, uh, these, and these Indian resistors and they stand up again and take it and they take it and they take it. So, as the course develops, I'm trying to get students to seriously consider um, how they can respond to a violent world uh, nonviolently. Um, another work I have them consider is a book by Paul Loeb, which is called Soul of a Citizen. And he says there's a myth about uh, uh, nonviolent activism, right? Which is that you're supposed to be 100% knowledgeable on the subject matter. You're supposed to be perfectly eloquent you're supposed to be incredibly courageous. And he said, those are all myths. Every one of us who does this kind of stuff, we don't know everything. We have got lots of questions. We're not all art articulate, eloquent speak spokespersons. And we're scared cr out of crap. I mean, it's, it's hard to do, right? But you still do it, right? And the idea is if you do it slowly but surely, um, with some kind of passion, with some kind of intelligence and some kind of research, you'll be surprised how effective it is in getting other people with you and how effective it is in making you feel like you're a riveting person in this democracy. Part of my requirement for my course is I have a, um, a community project. They have to, for, out of a 14-week semester, they have to spend two and a half hours at least outside of class doing something good for the community in many different forms. Some, some work in a soup kitchen, uh, we have a weekly vigil in Farmington out in front of the post office, Women in Black and Veterans for Peace. Some will join us for that. Um, this last year, I put together a uh, meal for veterans on Veterans Day. All right? Imagine this now. All right? This is a peace studies course from a university. We have it in the local church. We advertise it. We got about 75 people to attend it. The kids raised themselves. They raised 300 bucks for it. They waited the tables. We had special t-shirts made. Um, and was given free to us by a t-shirt uh, company in, in Farmington. And, in this, and, it's all, and I do it all by consensus, right? We're in a class and I say, okay, we gotta agree on this. Who wants to do this, who doesn't? What do you wanna do? So what's the message, right? And uh, uh, almost a, um, a knee-jerk response is, thank you for your service. And I draw back and I say, look, I said, many of us have problems with that particular phrasing, to tell you the truth. See if we can come up with something else. And this young student said, how about we care? Perfect, all right? So then we did this black t-shirt, a red heart, it said we care, uh, combat boots underneath this, uh, and uh, welcome home, okay? So they, so wearing these t-shirts. So the veterans start coming into this, into the church for this meal. They don't know what to expect. Some of them are, are old duffers like me, right? whatever. So I tell the students beforehand, so they get ready for, I said, okay, here's two things you have to do. One is, Lean forward when somebody sits down with a dinner and say, what's your MOS? <laughs> okay, right? Right? Because, the, and, and, and the response was these guys are going, you know what an MOS is? Right? An MOS is, is military occupational specialty. What's your, what was your job? They're just blown away that this 18-year-old kid can look them in the eye and go, so what was your MOS? Then the other thing I tell them, I says, don't say, I can't imagine. 
say, I'm trying to imagine what it was like for what you did, right? And then let the evening go on. And it, uh, this last semester, it, it went beautifully, right? I mean, these kids were engaged in these conversations. They felt really good about what they did. Um, it's a peace studies course. You know, they know that, you know, how we're supposed to be responding to war and all this kind of stuff, yet we're not attacking the individual soldier, right? The individual veteran. We're looking at the system, which is one, one of the articles I have them read by Martin Luther King Jr. says exactly that. He said, you know, you don't, you don't hate that, one, that white guy there that's beating up on you. You hate the system that provokes him to do that. And that's where we have to work. We have to get looking at the system. We have to work with each other. We have to communicate as much as we possibly can. So they get this stuff throughout the course. Then I show them, I think there's three movies I show them. Uh, one is um, uh, uh, Letters, Letters Home from the, from the War, which is an HBO special documentary, right? Uh, it's, I think it's beautifully done, and it's not politically charged, okay? They're expecting politically charged stuff from me now. And I say, no, no, no. It's, it's, it, it's very even keeled, but it's all um, documentary footage, and it's all letters written by men and women who were in Vietnam read by professional actors with an amazing musical score, by the way. I love to tease the students. I say, you know, they don't make music like this anymore. Listen to this. Listen to the Rolling Stones, man, come on. Yeah. And the kids, of course, come back at me and they say, well, listen to this. And they have, they have their own rap song. So it's really, it's really kind of cool. I also show them the, uh, a, uh, the movie um, uh, uh, Ground Truth, which is, again, documentary footage, and it's Iraq War veterans. Documentary footage from the Iraq War and Iraq War veterans talking about their experience, men and women, by the way. Now we've got you know, women combat uh, 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 testimonies and stuff like that. So, so they'll watch that. And, and my finally, final kicker is a, is a documentary of Joan Baez. Uh, it's American Masters series from, from NPR. If you have not seen this movie, I highly recommend it, right? Joan Baez was on the cover of Time Magazine when she was like 22 years old, the queen of folk, right? She was it. She dropped out of college, sang, you know, the streets of, of Boston, became this, this icon, right, of folk music. And then early on, she decided to work for other people. And she worked in the civil rights movement. She was down in, in, in Mississippi. Uh, she was down some places before King got down there, right? And she, she found out, she said she loves to talk about this. She said, you know, she was young, maybe she was 25 then, 26 maybe. And she said she discovered that people who were organizing her concerts down in the South were segregating them. And she said, no, no, I want, you have to integrate my concerts. And so they have this guy there talking about what it was like to go, and she brings in this you know, African-American choir and all that kind of stuff. So she does that kind of work. Then during the Vietnam War, um, she's showing, uh, and Dave, David Crosby, Crosby Stills and Nash is interviewed, and he said, I couldn't believe this. There's, there's Joni, right, uh, standing there. The kids are get, getting off the bus. I was drafted, so I know what this is like. Kids are getting off the bus, they're drafted, and getting ready to go into the military and stuff like that. She's there trying to convince them to join the anti-war movement, join us, join us, join us. And it shows some guys actually doing it. Then she gets arrested, right? And she gets sent to this little prison camp. She's there for a few days. She gets back out, as David Crosby says, she gets back out, goes home, takes a shower, and goes right back out there, right? Then she also goes to Vietnam. She's there in 1972. She's in North Vietnam when the Christmas bombings took place, right? She was there, all right? There's footage, and, and Eric can touch, footage of her there during this. She went through this. Then she's in um, Sarajevo, years later, with the, 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 uh, the guy playing the cello, the cello. Uh, yeah, no, well, it's a, it's a, a um, it's a guy that called him the, the cellist of Sarajevo or something like, he, he literally would take a chair, sit in the square, and there's, I mean, there's bombs and snipers and all that stuff. He sit there in a chair in a tuxedo, playing his cello, right? And she came over and sat next to him. And they sang together and stuff, it's beautiful. So, the message I'm trying to get across to the students by showing this movie, and many of my students are women, saying, you know, th this is what peace activism can be. This is what, and she's, and she's taken a commitment to nonviolence too. This is what it can look like. And there's an artist, of course now she's in, in her late 70s, so she's her grandmother's, you know. Uh, here's an artist who took her career, took the art form that she's got, and turned it into something to work for peace, so, which we can all do, no matter what field we get into. All right, no matter where you go, you can use your profession, your field, to advocate for world peace. And of course, also, I have research papers and, and group presentations and the usual stuff and final exam, midterm exam, and, and four essays that they have to write, uh, all on these topics um, that are revolving around this book. Uh, and there's a, 
Staunton and Alice Lynn are very special people. Staunton Lynn was a professor at Yale University who went to Vietnam during the Vietnam War and he got fired for what he did. He became then, he became an activist. He and Alice uh, became activist lawyers uh, working for labor unions and, uh, and they moved to Youngstown, Ohio and did all this work. But they put together this collection uh, as well as other things. And he writes here in this book, he said, okay, what's, so what's nonviolence? He says it includes the following overlapping but distinct elements. One, refusal to retaliate. Two, acting out of conviction by demonstrative action. Three, deliberate law-breaking for conscience sake. And then he says, in this volume, nonviolence means all of these things and something more, the vision of love as an agent for fundamental social change. And King says the same thing. He calls it agape. It's unconditional love. It's not brotherly love, it's not sisterly love, it's unconditional love for fellow human beings, right? That's the driving force. And if we can look at the world through that particular lens, perhaps, perhaps we can get out of the mess that we're in. Um, so, that's my course, I suppose. Somewhat of a nutshell. Sounds interesting. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, not everybody loves it. I kids drop out of it. <laughs> you know, I tell them, I have a very detailed syllabus. I say, here's what you're required of you, okay? Uh, and we're all adults in this room now. It's the first college experience for them. So you can drop this course, you know, and some do, right? They don't want, the, they don't want to do the work, I suppose, or the subject matter doesn't appeal to them. Whatever, I'm okay with that. Um, have you had any vets in any of your Yes, yes. This last semester I had this young man who was an Air Force veteran for six years. It was a, it was a great, great talk. The previous semester, this, uh, this, I love non-traditional students, right? This woman was in the class, I, she's probably in her late 30s. She had three kids of her own. Her husband was an Iraq War veteran. She and her husband were working on a small farm. They took in two more kids, okay? Now here she is, a college student, right? And well, she had also had a job as a, as a barmaid, too, uh, in, in, in town, right? So she's working these, all these jobs and stuff like that. She loved the course. And she brought in her, her perspective and stuff like that. When we did our veterans dinner, she had her husband show up with his buddies and stuff like that. So it was, it was re very rewarding. Um, yeah, I've had veterans in the course before. I, I'm trying to remember if I've had any confrontations with veterans. I, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. so. I can't remember any. I've had students who really uh, get very belligerent. Um, they're, they're fed this way of thinking and they just don't want to let it go. Um, so I'll get some real pushback from some students, right? So, and I, you know, you get evaluations at the end of the course and I get, I get good, good evaluations, but I get some kids who just say, you know, I didn't like this, I, you know, I thought he was biased or something like that, whatever. I try not to be, but. Um, We're all biased. We are. <laughs> well, How, Howard Zinn, a, me a fellow member of Veterans for Peace, by the way, a Marxist historian, wrote a book called Objections to Objectivity. And he said, there's no, he, did. he said, there's no such thing as objective history. He said, it's all subjective. You come from it f with an ideology. And he said the perfect example in his first chapter in his book, People's History of the United States, which is a fascinating book, is about Columbus. And he said, you know, what's chosen as the definitive biography of Christopher Columbus was written by this guy named Samuel Elliot Morrison or something, something along those lines. And he said, naval historian. Yes, okay. <laughs> and, he, and he looks at Columbus and he said what, what, and he said, and Zinn says, he didn't lie in this book, but what he said, he looked at Columbus as an amazing navigator, as somebody who really knew, and he, said, he mentioned parenthetically, oh, by the way, they slaughtered the Arawak Indians uh, in order to find gold and all that stuff. And Zinn says, this is what I'm talking about. He said, what I'm going to do, Zinn says in his course, he says, I'm going to take the perspective of the Arawak India. I'm going to take the perspective of the woman working in the textile mills. I'm going to take the perspective of the slave in the, in, in, in the plantation system. And I'm going to tell my history of America through their eyes. All right? And he said, an honest historian should do that. And every time they write a history book, they say, here's my basic ideology. Here's what I'm going to choose. And I say that to the students. I say, you know, there's so much material to choose for this course. I select what I think is important based on my own ideology. I'm trying to teach a course, I'm trying to get you to be better writers, I'm trying to get you to be you know, comfortable with, with the university setting, but let's not fool ourselves, right? I have a particular angle, and I'm willing to argue that with you. And I, you know, and I hope the students, some students take that seriously. And, you know, so. But the whole idea of, of nonviolence is to sort of 
Because I tell the students, I say, you know, we got to talk, this course, you've got to talk, we've got to talk with some degree of love, and we've got to talk in terms of inc inclusion as, as opposed to excluding other people. How can we bring people into this conversation um, and do it? Um, and I get great, great research papers written by students, and then they do um, group presentations based on their research, uh, where they can bring in video clips and music and stuff. I, I had like, fall semester. I had two students do uh, uh, papers and presentations on the Vietnam War. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a veteran of that war, right? I've read a lot about it. I found out things from these students that I didn't even, I didn't even think of and didn't even know. Right? Um, one I really liked a lot was this young woman, she was focused on music, and she said, and it just blew me away, she said, you know, I think this is the first war in history where the soldiers who were fighting in Vietnam were listening to the same music as the people who were fighting against the war at the same time. I thought, holy shit, she's right. She's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the animals, we got to get out of this place. I mean, that was our theme song, right? You know? You know and, and, she, and, and I said, I, you know, I never thought, she just put it together. So I tell the students, I say, you know, the book is not written on any of this stuff. You guys have something to contribute uh, to, the, to the literature, to the, to, to the, the academic study of these, of these wars. Um, and, the, and the other uh, a, a student uh, brought up this stuff about Joan Baez, which I kind of knew about, but she got intrigued by the movie we showed in Baez, and she did a little bit more research in what she was doing and she talked a little bit about what her relationship, Bias's relationship with David Harris, who was involved in the anti-war movement and they had a child together and all that kind of stuff. And she enriched our conversation about who David Harris was, sacrifices that they both made in order to try to make this marriage work, which didn't eventually work. All of that was added to... He went to jail. He went to jail, right, yeah, for 19 months, I think it was. And, they, and his, his son was born when, she was, when he was in jail. And they stayed together, I think, maybe six, eight months afterwards. Um, they used to go on tour before, they, before he went into jail, he went on tour. She would sing, he would talk, uh, draft, burn your draft cards kind of stuff. Um, they went all around the country doing that kind of stuff. So, um, fascinating stuff. So it's still, to me, it's a, I like the idea of peace studies because it's still something that's still going on. We all need to learn more and more about it. Uh, we can learn from each other. Um, and the work obviously is not done. But um, we're tabling next to a couple of young women who are doing uh, solar power stuff. And, it, and, and, and they said to this to me, they said, we still have hope, you know. And I said, I know you do, you know, and I'm glad you have hope. So I'm with you on that. I, I still have hope, too. I think we can have, we can resolve this stuff. We can have a peaceful world. So that's peace studies. What's, course. what's the average general knowledge level of these students coming in about Vietnam? Oh, very. Uh, most of it's uh, most of it's minimal. Okay, most most of it's they're coming from stories they've been told. They, most of them come from rural communities. Uh, UMF is population. But we get some kids coming from the cities. So most of them have come with this notion of uh, how badly Vietnam veterans were treated. That's where they. That's their knowledge work. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't try to embarrass them by asking them questions like, "So which side did we so supposedly fight for, the North or the South?" But they don't even know that kind of stuff. They don't know the kind of the basics of the war itself, nor the anti-war movement, right? Um, so you have to move gently in those waters, right? They probably know, they're more comfortable talking about World War II than they are about Vietnam, because Vietnam is still raw in their, some of their families, very raw in some of really? their families. Yeah, oh yeah. So I mean, you know, I've had students, young woman this last semester, who uh, was a strong, strong, strong Christian. She got into a lot of grief in her school for taking these stances and all that kind of stuff. And she came to me and she said, I can't believe how horribly you guys were treated. I'm a Christian and all this kind of stuff. And I try to gently move her from that conversation, which is, you know, there's a, been a book about, written about it called The uh, Spitting Image, which is about the myth that all Vietnam veterans were spat upon when they came back. I try to move her gently into the area that maybe, just maybe, um, that isn't the full picture, that you should have to look at the whole, whole picture of it. But most of them are pretty much, um, Un, fairly uninformed about the war itself. Uh, I don't spend, you know, out of a 14-week class, I probably spend maybe two and a half, three weeks total on the Vietnam War, and civil, mostly civil rights. So, I mean, the beauty of this book, for example, is you have people writing in World War I and World War II the same kind of stuff 
resistance to the war that took place in, in Vietnam. There's a wonderful book, a wonderful essay in here by Jane Addams, where she went to Europe just before the beginning of the uh, First World War, our engagement with it. Uh, it already was beginning to rage over. She came back here to the United States and said, don't get involved in this war. And look, you know what they're doing? Uh, she said, you know, the British troops know when they're going to go over the trenches because they're given rum. The German troops know when something's going to happen because they're given ether. The French troops are given, I forget what, what they, the A thing, the thing that they used to get high on. And she came back to the United States, she told, and they, and they accused her of not supporting the troops. They you know, attacked her, all that kind of stuff. Same crap that happens at, with every war. It happened with that, uh, the same kind of uh, 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 approach. Um, William James wrote a, uh, an amazing essay I had the students read. He wrote it in 1917, I think, called The Moral Equivalent of War. Right? Uh, it's brilliant. It starts out, but you think this guy's supporting war, because what happens, soldiers, there's tremendous camaraderie, they're out of their cells, they're fighting for a, a purpose above and beyond themselves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then he just flips it around midway in the essay, he flips it around and says, but, so why do we have to kill other human beings in order to get this kind of camaraderie? Why can't we work for, well, he saw it against nature, it was, it was you know, the early 20th century, that was the naturalism movement, it was against nature, but basically he's, he provided the, the, the uh, um, foundation for the Peace Corps and AmeriCorps and all these other kinds of things. Why can't we have this dedication for two years, uh, working for a cause above and beyond yourself, where you're making sacrifices, you're working with others, you're learning this stuff and stuff, but you're not picking up a weapon and killing other human beings. 1917, he wrote that, right? Um, there's the Kellogg-Briand Agreement, where all these nations, including the United States, signed on to say, we're never gonna go to war again, outlawing war. Right? So students don't, not, not only do they not know about Vietnam, but they don't know that kind of history uh, at all, actually. Um, I have read stuff about the Seabrook uh, occupations as well. Um, the feminization of the, uh, of the environmental movement, a wonderful essay by Judy Barr uh, about getting the, the feminist perspective into this, which was at that point, at the, at early on in the environmental movement was a very much of a macho movement. You know, guys chaining themselves to trees, fighting bulldozers and all that kind of stuff. Judy Barr came in and said, wait, you know, this is all well and good, but how can we spread this out and make it a much more of a communal uh, effort, right? And she was severely wounded, by the way. They blew up her car. They almost killed her um, because of that. But anyways, it's that kind of, uh, of, of activism that I keep on exposing the students to as much as possible. And if you've ever taught, you know, you, you, never, you never can predict what the result of your teaching will ever be, right? You hope you've had an effect, but um, well, that's peace studies. <laughs> well, can, can you hear me? Can you, can you hear me now? <laughs> you know, it's funny you should say that. I just went out to lunch on Tuesday with a woman whose name is Arangi. She's from Sri Lanka. She graduated 25 years ago. She just contacted me. She said, I'm in a, she lives down in Pennsylvania. She said, I'm in Augusta, Maine right now. Can we go out to lunch? I said, sure. I mean, she's talking to me about what happened in class 25 years ago. I'm trying to think to myself, what the hell did I teach? What I don't know, you know, I don't know. But it was, she had all of this stuff that she remembered, right? Oh, you did this, you did this, we did this, we took this trip to Boston, we did that, you know. So, and teaching is, that's the joy of teaching, right? I mean, it doesn't always happen, but there are, there are moments like that when you think, wow, okay. Um, yeah, it works. I have students joining our, our peace vigil on a regular basis now, even after the class is over with, because they got into that kind of thing. So, I don't know. So she came back to talk about favorite parts of the class? Yeah, but not that particular course. I hadn't been teaching that course. I was teaching a writing course. I was teaching actually history of Western thought, but I also taught that in a philosophy course. So we were talking about that, but it's that notion of 25 years later coming back, right? And her, her memory is so fresh, and I, you know, I'm old, right? My memory's gone. And, and she kept on bringing up these things, and it's so rewarding. A, to, to re be reminded of them, but, but B, also to see her perspective uh, as something that uh, she found something of real value in what we did in the class. And, I, and I'm, I, I'm really being genuine when I say a, a classroom is a collection. It's not just me spouting off. It's the other students, and it's a conversation that enriches it. And when you're in a good class with students who really care and, and are doing the work, it's, it's amazing. It's exponentially uh, 
knowledge of stuff has just in, in, increased exponentially. So, um, so I don't I don't take credit for all of that, but I take credit for organizing the course, getting them to come sit down in the class, and then directing the conversation. So it, it was meaningful for us. So. Did you watch the Ken Burns Vietnam I did. special? Oh, did I ever? Okay. What did you think Let's of it? Do it? I personally, it was. I couldn't watch them. I started to watch several episodes. Well, if you have go to go to, the, to a website where I, I wrote every episode, I, I, Judy, my wife, is, we've been married 47 years. Okay? Judy met me when I got out of Vietnam in San Francisco, and we hitchhiked across the country for three weeks. We've been together ever since, right? Wow. She sat next to me as I watched that every night, right? And what I did at, at, the, at the end of every episode, I came downstairs, and, and I sat in front of my computer, and I said, I'm going to write something and I'll be done by one o'clock in the morning. So they would usually have done about 10. So I sat and I wrote, I commented on every episode. Uh, and, I, and, I, and it, was not, it wasn't an analysis as much as it was a heartfelt response to each episode, right? Um, and we've actually, actually, we're contesting um, it, it being awarded an Emmy because we don't think it should be. Um, although we found some valuable stuff in each one. Um, I did anyways. But I came to the conclusion about four episodes in that it wasn't really what a documentary is supposed to be uh, and I you know I define a documentary pr fairly strictly as you know being based on some historical fact uh, starting from a basic premise uh, reaching conclusions building a logical structure like a scaffolding that you see where the conclusion comes from but what Burns and Novak did was they turned it into what I call theater they turned it into these heartfelt anecdotal Common comments by people, which I found valuable. I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't valuable, but we're, we were concerned about this being the go-to piece that t students would turn to to learn about the Vietnam War. We th a, it started with a, a, the basic premise, which we disagree with wholeheartedly. They say it in the first episode, that the United States was well-intentioned in what they were doing. Things just went awry. Strategically, things went wrong. And we say, there was no good intentions at all from the front end of this thing. It was pure colonialism. It was, you know, uh, to, we, to many of us, an immoral and unjust war, period. Done deal. Okay. So, but that said, then you listen to the commentary, and I have friends who are in that. Uh, Bill Earhart, in particular, is a good friend of mine, uh, commenting about their stuff. And so I saw, I, I saw some value in it. I found it very difficult to watch uh, in, ter in terms of um, especially... Uh, I was in an artillery unit, especially the artillery and the, and, and the, and the, and the sounds. The, the M60, rat, every, every episode had M60s rattling away and M79s going. And, and we were with 175 and 8 inches, which are heavy artillery howitzers. And they would rock the house, you know, and I'd hear that on the, and I'd say, Jesus Christ, you know, I just, wow. So it was difficult to watch in those terms. On the other hand, one of the things, and I mentioned this, that I really appreciate was the way they used music all the way through it, right? So I, I have a running commentary. I'll I send it to you if you want, uh, for what it's worth. Um, Common Dreams picked it up, and, um, and Counterpunch uh, picked up some of those things. And Eric, Eric sitting here, just returned from uh, filming 40 hours of film in Vietnam. Uh, and we're trying, to, we're trying to craft a two-hour film based on his interviews with people over there. Not as a counter to Burns and Novak, we don't want to go there, but a way to enrich the conversation, right? Because Burns and Novak left a lot of stuff out. And, you know, and, it, and to be fair to anybody who calls himself a d documentarian, of course you're not going to cover everything everybody wants, right? I mean, it's a, it's a selection process. But we just felt that there was a lot of stuff that was left out of that that um, needs to be looked at uh, more, more carefully. But, um, it's an exercise in um, perseverance to sit through those things. It really is. 18 hours. It must have been. Yeah. Eight, 18 hours of it. Um, you know, I was, you know, I'd be furiously taking notes and stuff like that, and then I'd get lost in it, come back in, out of it. But um, full disclosure, uh, yeah, Vietnam full, VietnamFullDisclosure.org. It's got the episodes, my responses to each episode. And also Howie, Howie Mactinger, who's an historian, his responses to the, to the film is from a historian's perspective. Uh, as well, uh, so yeah, I mean it's 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 well worth the conversation. You know, people said, well, don't you know, don't you think it was valuable? Yeah, I had people stopping me in the streets in Farmington, Maine, and saying, you were in Nam, right? What do you think of that movie? Said, well, and we'd have a conversation, right, which we wouldn't have had if that didn't happen. So you know, 
I think it's it was good, but, but I mean, my thing is, you know, when 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 you have stuff like, um, you when, when you see a young person in that in that film playing with his sister or something like that in the background backyard or something like that, you know, he's dead. Because that's the way the film worked. You yeah, became sympathetically involved with him. Boom! You know, you know, goddamn well. All of a sudden, he's he's dead, right? And then you have the mom talking about him and the sister talking about him. You can't fault that. I'm not going to criticize those people for their responses to the loss of a loved one. And that's powerful stuff. And I think that's 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 good. I think that's the kind of stuff we should be looking at the human human element of the war, as opposed to the strategy of it and this, that, and everything else. But uh, and it did show. Uh, it, it showed more of the Vietnamese perspective than most people have ever been exposed to. Not enough yes. as far as we're concerned. All right. That was an interesting yeah, part of it. Yeah. It, it showed the iniquity of the presidents from Kennedy forward, you know, who, were, uh, who refused to get out of that war uh, for political reasons, even though they knew that, they were, that it was not a winnable, whatever a winnable war is. It was. So um, I think it had some value along those lines, for sure. Did you read Jimmy Webb's book, Fields of Fire? No. No. Re recommend it? Yeah, again, yeah. pretty intense book. But yeah. You know Jimmy Webb. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was his Senator. first book about his. Yeah. yeah. He was class of 68. Yeah. At the Academy, I was class of 71. So. Really? Have you read Andrew Basevich's stuff? Do you know Andrew Basevich? Historian, military historian, Boston University. He was a NOM. He was 20 year career. His son was killed in Iraq as a captain in Iraq. He, he writes this incredibly, he writes, he writes for um, Tom Dispatch, a, a lot of stuff for Tom Dispatch, but he writes these incredibly analytical pieces, right? He's not a, he's not a bleeding heart at all, right? He just looks at the, how the military has been misused, right? And obviously having his son killed in that war directly impacted him. He's a West Point graduate, you know, the whole it's nine years. Imagine. Yeah, yeah, try to imagine. <laughs> Try to imagine. No, no, that's true. That's you know. I, well, I have a 42-year-old son, right? I mean, I, I just it it'll it, it, be. I don't know what I would. I don't know how I would be if my if my kid were killed in a war. So, you know, we we do this. By the way, we do this letters to the wall, and these are all. Um, we, we've done 400 letters the last four years. We have people write letters. Anybody who is directly impacted by the Vietnam War, including people who served in the war as well as people who resisted against it, people who went to Canada. Um, there's a w beautiful letters in here written by a woman whose grandfather was killed in the war. All kinds of different people. And, we, and, and we've delivered these walls, these letters to the wall every Memorial Day. And we'll be doing it, we've done it for the last four, we'll probably do it for the next six. Uh, we have another volume coming out, by the way. So this is our first volume, about 150 letters. Um, amazing stuff in here. The second one I've got, and, and I, I don't know, I'll keep on going on until you tell me to shut up, but I, I was down there on Memorial Day this, this year with a guy named Frank Corcoran. Frank Corcoran was a Marine, and he was severely wounded, shot in the stomach. Um, I've been, I know him. I've been writing back and forth. I said, Frank, you've got to write a letter. He finally wrote this letter to the wall, right? It's a letter to these two guys who died saving his life. Frank was hit in the stomach. He explains it in the letter. He's laying there. He's bleeding to death. These two guys crawl over and lay on top of him and are shot and killed, right? Saving his life. So Frank has lived with this now. All, I mean, talk about survivor's guilt to the nth degree. So Frank finally write, writes this letter uh, and he takes it to the wall and we're delivering it to the wall, right? Uh, and we both discovered, we didn't know this, if the, the wall is based on when guys were killed chronologically, right? I didn't know that they're also based on during, on a given day. So if Joe Adams, was killed and then Frank Wainwright was, was killed. Everybody in between Joe Adams and Frank Wright were killed on the same day. And then the alphabet starts again another day. So Frank is looking at this and he goes, holy shit. He says, Mikey's name is down here and Danny's name is up here. That means Danny, last he, he, he survived five days after that. I must have been in the same hospital as he was, right? And he's just, he has this revelation. And, and you know, Memorial Day in, in Washington, D.C. at the wall, it's packed with people. And Frank just sort of disappeared back into the crowd, right? Uh, and just stood there. And, and the beauty of doing what we do, by the way, we write these, we say on the envelopes, we say, please read me. Uh, um, and because if you leave something at the wall, 
most of the time it's very personal, right? You don't pick up something that somebody's left to their loved one. So we write on, the, on these envelopes, like, please read me, all right? And so Frank can stand there and watch these people pick up his letter and read it. Go, Holy shit, whoa, right? That's therapeutic, I think. That's a healing process that we're going through. Because we're using these, our, our experiences, we hope, to make people realize truly what the, what the true costs of war really are. Um, so this is, this is volume one. Volume two is coming out. Uh, this is the 2015 and 2016. Uh, 2017 and 2018 is at the printers right now. Uh, I should have a, a galley copy of it next week to look at, and then we're gonna put it out there um, for another 150 letters or so. Um, very powerful letters. Very Survivor's powerful. guilt is interesting. Survivor's guilt is a very interesting. Yeah. Can, I can't imagine. Well, there's, there's one letter written in here by Peggy Akers. Peggy was a nurse in Vietnam. Um, a beautiful letter. I've been to the wall with her. And I, I do what I call walking the wall. I start with the panel that I, that I, uh, when I got in Vietnam, and I walk to the panel when I got out of Vietnam. There's 9,800 names on that wall. It's the time I was over there, right? Peggy stands in front of one panel, all right, because she was a nurse. She had to do triage. A list of all these guys that died on the same day, all right, she was there, all right, and she looks at those, at those names, all right? It's tough stuff. It's tough stuff. Stuff you don't want, you don't want your own kids or grandkids to go through ever, right? Uh, on the other hand, it's our, we feel Veterans for Peace is our responsibility to keep picking away at these scars, <laughs> you know, to, to, not, not to get any kind of, uh, well, Eric, is, it's, we're in the same, we're in the same boat, I guess, but you know, it's not necessarily attention drawn to ourselves, but it's basically saying, you know, to, to young people, right, back to my whole theme about peace studies, you can't, you can't use war to resolve difficulties, it just doesn't freaking work. Longest war in American history. Yeah, don't even hear about that stuff anymore. Yeah, this young man who was in my, uh, in my classes last semester, Air Force veteran, uh, who was talking about stuff. It's, it's so valuable to have something like that in your class because he can talk to the students. He'll turn around to the students and say, this is what it was like. You want to know what it was like? I'll tell you what it was like. And say, whoa, okay, go for it, man. Go for it. So, that's, I mean, I think we just have to, as, as veterans, we have an obligation to, to talk to people about it, right? And be supportive of our fellow veterans. I. I I, every week I go up to Togus and I work up in the psychiatric ward. I lead discussions using veterans poetry, um, just to sort of help people sort things out, you know, a little bit, just a little bit, you know. Not, I don't pretend to be, I'm not a psychologist or anything like that, but just that notion of having a group of people, and we're all veterans in that room, and the nurse talking about stuff, sharing, sharing stuff. It's yeah, incredible. Just isn't equipped to handle all the PTSD. They don't have the money. I, I, I I'm talking to people. I have. I've been, I, I told the, I told the guy, I have a doctor at the VA now, and I told him, I said, I stayed away from you guys for 40 years, right? I just came back after I retired because I wanted to do this volunteer work. I am in love with these nurses. These nurses are so dedicated, uh, so incredibly kind, uh, but they need more nurses and they need more money for the stuff that they do. We have an old, have this Xerox machine that I have to keep on kicking to use the goddamn thing. Come on, right? You know? So, I, I, I'm totally opposed to the privatization of the VA, for sure. But uh, I, I think that I think they do remarkable work up there. Um, oh, I have. Well, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. She said it. She asked for it. Right. So I happen to have poems that I'll pass out to you. Uh, fresh off the press. Okay. Um, I have this this poem. I have two poems that I've done. I call them my remorse poems. Um, when, and um, I've had them translated into Vietnamese, uh, and they were uh, actually Eric took some of them over to Vietnam. So this first one's entitled "The Girl in the Picture." If I say that to a Viet anybody who's an adult during the Vietnam War, you say "The Girl in the Picture," everybody knows the iconic picture of the young girl, the nine-year-old girl fleeing the Napalm Village, right? All right. Uh, I wrote this poem. Uh, Oh that's, your, oh, that's your hat, not mine, <laughs> sorry. So I wrote this poem uh, realizing my granddaughter was nine, was nine years old, right, when I wrote this poem. And I found out that Kim, the young woman who's in that picture, was nine years old when that picture was taken. So that clicked this. So this poem 
past. Is this poem started as a suicide poem? Okay. Um, see where it goes. It's called The Girl in the Picture. There's a traditional line to turn the whole poem around. So whatever you run from becomes your shadow. Whatever you run from becomes your shadow. If you're a non-vet, a survivor of sorts, she'll come for you across the decades, casting a shadow in a dying light of your dreams, naked and nine, terror in her eyes. Of course you'll have to ignore her. If you wish to survive over the years, but then your daughters will turn nine, and then your granddaughters nine, as the shadows lengthen. So you have no choice on that one night screaming down a ridge road, lights off under a full moon. She's standing in the middle of the road, still naked and nine, terror in her eyes. Now you must stop to pick her up, to carry her back home to where she came from, to that gentle village where the forgiving and the forgiven gather at high noon. There are no shadows. So this started as a suicide. I, I live out in Chesterville, and there's a road called the Ridge Road, which I've driven for 40 some odd years, which is an esker. And, it, and, and I've driven it in the wintertime. All you have to do is take your steering wheel and go, Psst! and it's lights out. It's all over with, right? Uh, so there's this image, okay, God, you know, it's just the war is way too much. And then there's this, it comes to me, there's this young, there she is, standing there. And I, and I have my theory is that we have no right to ask the Vietnamese to forgive us for what we did, right? All we can do is do good work, we hope. We hope that they'll bestow forgiveness on us, but I have no right to ask them for forgiveness, right? I can't do that. So this is a poem of remorse. Um, she asked for these, by the way, so let me read the other one. Give you the other one, my remorse poem. I was in a, like I mentioned before, I was in an artillery unit uh, supporting the 175. <laughs> Airborne, <laughs> eventually this will end. Right. Okay, um, and so we have a chapter of Veterans for Peace in Vietnam. They've been there for 30 years, I think, Chuck Searcy's work, and, and, they've, and there are, many of them are American veterans. Uh, Eric knows them, uh, and they've worked with the Vietnamese people to help them deal with unexploded ordnance, which is a horrific problem in that country, right? Little kids wandering around in rice paddies, stumble on a bomb, boom, it's all over with, right? Um, so. Chuck and his, and his group of people have tried to train people how to deal with unexploded ordnance and stuff. So I wrote this poem for him. Um, and, the, and, and he said, he wrote me back immediately, he said, Doug, he said, don't write it just for me, write it also for the Vietnamese that helped me. Okay, so unexploded ordnance, a battle for Chuck Searcy and the thousands of Vietnamese who have labored off and on since 1975, working to undo what we have done. So I was maybe all at 21 when they whipped me into some kind of soulless shape. Yet another one of America's weeping mother's sons sent forth into this world to raise, pillage, and rape. And now it's coming on to another Christmas Eve and songs of joy and peace fill up our little town. How, I asked myself, could I possibly believe I could do what I did and not reap what I had sown? In that land far away from what I call home, a grandfather leads his granddaughter by the hand into a field where we did what had to be done. They trip into a searing heat, brighter, than a thousand suns. And that's a picture of me, of my wonderful friend, Carol Scribner, uh, who died. Uh, this is from a photograph. She did this etch etching for me, for my book. That's me with my little, one of my granddaughters walking down the path. And they are translated into Vietnamese. Um, so, um, so that's the kind of stuff we do, right? Um, Eric is a filmmaker. He's putting together this amazing film, but maybe next year at this time, he'll pull up in a limousine and, and he'll get out and we'll have all of these cameras around and say, there's Eric Herter, there he is, there he is. <laughs> so, but we're doing all this work. I mean, I, and, I, and, 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 and we, we just, we've been talking, look at some of this footage. And I think you said it beautifully. He said, this is, you know, this film is your love song to Vietnam, right? I mean, that's, that's the way I kind of feel about these poems, it's remorse, it's some, somehow, somehow, somehow give back something to the Vietnamese people, right? And, and, and have peop make people aware of how horrible that war was and how courageous and amazing the Vietnamese people are and were, even though they were our enemies. We love to have these, so we have these, our convention, and inevitably, you'll get somebody like Sewell Jones. You ever met Sewell Jones? He was a Marine in Nam. Yeah. Sitting around saying, "Oh yeah, I'm, I'm I'm in Hanoi drinking beer with this guy who was in the NDA, right?" And this guy's saying, "I tried to fucking kill you. Yeah, I tried to fucking kill you too, man." And they, you know, they get drunk together. <laughs> War's over with.
they use the F word in this. You have to edit this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, that doesn't matter. So I think the arts are really important. Um, yeah, what amazed me was yes. how John McCain was able to find forgiveness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. He, he had a lot of those guys. Yeah. Really got treated. Oh, yeah. Really bad. Oh, yeah. You know, that's why John Stockdale, yeah. head POW, said no more escapes because every time, every guy that tried to escape that got captured, they just beat him to death. Yeah. And then they beat up everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Of course, we were doing the same thing, you understand, right? There were tiger cages. We had tiger cages. We had places that, you know, that yeah. they would not allow you to take a picture if you had a little instrument camera of certain uh, conixes um, where the Vietnamese people were taken. The morality of war, yes. And put inside these things in the tremendous heat. Well, thank you, Doug. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, that was... oh, thanks, for thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here.